I, I went to uh, you know the, the senior partners in the firm uh, and said, I'm going to pursue what's in my heart. So what are you doing? You're not practicing law? I said, no, I'm going to be an agent. They're like, what's that? <laughs> I want to welcome everybody to, to today's Counting Capital podcast. It's my great pleasure to have as my guest today, my good friend, Buchanan investor, Jeff Morad. We've been members of the same YPO forum now for 20 years where we've had either lunch or dinner uh, once, a, once a month for 20 years. So uh, this is a, a very comfortable uh, uh, session that I'll be having with my friend, Jeff. Uh, for your knowledge and everybody listening, Jeff's been named one of the most 100 most powerful people in sports. He began his career in athlete representation, building a powerhouse sports agency with Lee Steinberg. He moved on to the principal side, becoming an investor and CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks, then moving to vice chairman and partial owner of the San Diego Padres. He serves on the board of McLaren Racing, chairman of Morgan Lewis Global Sports Practice. But our focus today is to talk to Jeff about MSP, a private equity firm that invests in teams, leagues, and sports-related businesses. I know you're going to enjoy what Jeff has to share with us. So I think uh, maybe the best part to, to place to start, Jeff, might be with, um, tell us a little bit about how you, why you picked law to start your, um, your, your career. Uh, well, first of all, Robert, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, I chuckled when you said a Buchanan investor because <laughs> that's true in advertising. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I was never that smart uh, as it related to sciences and didn't think I was that good at numbers. And so I, I kind of figured I had to do something and law seemed to be a path that made sense. Um, the irony is I, I barely practiced it over my career, but uh, it was, a, you know, in retrospect, it was a good education that taught me how to spot issues. So even though my, my career veered toward a purer form of business, uh, as opposed to an advisor role, um, you know, even today, uh, what I learned in law school still helps me identify issues that I might not see otherwise. Uh, like all of you listening, I hire lawyers to go solve uh, those problems these days. Uh, but, uh, but you know, I don't regret the path. I suppose if I had to do it over again, I'd probably choose business school. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you actually pivoted quickly from law to sports. And I think my own alma mater at, at Cal might have a part piece in this story. So share, share that pivot, if you will. Sure. Uh, you know, six months into practicing for a you know LA-based litigation firm in their Newport Beach office, um, I I went to uh, you know the the senior partners in the firm uh, and said hey, I'm going to pursue what's in my heart. And at that time, it was to get involved in the sports industry. And uh, the simplest way to do that. It, it, although it wasn't all that simple, but was to uh, begin representing athletes. And so I used to tell people, this is in the you know, early 80s, 83, 84, uh, you know, they're, they're like, so what are you doing? You're not practicing law? I said, no, I'm going to be an agent. They're like, what's that? <laughs> and, you know, really in the early days of the agent business. And um, I said, you know, I'm going to represent players. Uh, and uh, I did. So I ended up piecing together about 20 uh, baseball players, a uh, uh, couple of football players as well, but uh, uh, we never made it. But, uh, but some of the baseball players were you know, guys like Will Clark and Matt Williams and uh, Chris Gwynn and Corey Snyder and hmm. a number of players who played for the Olympic baseball team, uh, the USA team in 1984 in Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, I represented five of the 20 players off that team. And um, through a variety of introductions and you know, kind of relationships, uh, I got to know uh, someone from your alma mater, Robert, uh, Lee Steinberg. 
And in early 85, uh, I went to work for Lee. Um, at the time, uh, he was a two-person agency, and uh, his partner ended up leaving about two and a half months after I got there, uh, which opened up an opportunity of a lifetime for me. Um, so, you know, we ended up uh, together for 18 years. Um, Lee and I had the largest NFL practice uh, in the country for all those 18 years, uh, second largest Major League Baseball practice, which was largely a function of that foundation that I had built on my own uh, back uh, before I joined Lee. And uh, under the name Steinberg and Morat, we had a, you know, kind of an idyllic practice. Uh, I loved the work. Uh, we worked hard, uh, you know, as uh, some would describe, a 25-8. Uh, that's certainly, uh, certainly the way it felt. But, uh, but there was some great, great memories and, and great business over time. And more than anything, it helped me create a network in this industry that uh, I've come to know so well. Well, it's uh, amazing. And <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, talk about ironies. Last night, I had the pleasure to have dinner and hear a presentation from one of your former clients, Drew Bledsoe. Uh, amazing guy. Uh, he regaled us in stories of his career, but really got into talking about his passion for business as he's expressed that in the wine arena uh, as a winemaker. But as I think, as I was interacting with him, I thought about you and I thought about the stereotype of the professional athlete. And what was that like for you as a client to be their fiduciary and to represent them, given that their skill sets might not be geared to what we would call conventional business experiences? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we didn't do financial advising. We always looked for and help them interview uh, folks who had what we considered to be a higher level of expertise. Um, you know, our expertise, if you will, was to maximize their compensation, uh, to structure agreements with teams that um, that really, you know, were, were better than they could do on their own, if not better than other representatives could achieve. So it was, uh, it was really that role that we restricted ourselves to, um, and then, as mentioned, relied on, on on others who had experience in advising on the financial front. We would often get involved, though, overseeing those relationships, uh, and we would, you know, kind of look after to the extent that uh, uh, we could, and we were allowed to, um, you know, their interests. And it would often be an advocate for you know, a variety of different issues uh, with their financial advisor. But we were really uh, in a role where our focus was on the agency uh, relationship and not to advise on the uh, finances. Look, Drew Bledsoe is a, you know, but one of many examples of the kind of athletes that we represented that, uh, that went on to, uh, to achieve, you know, even greater success as business people. You know, Steve Young sticks out as a as an example. Well, I think, um, you know, probably, you know, if it's possible, uh, beyond being an, an NFL Hall of Famer uh, and a Super Bowl champion, um, you know, he uh, probably is more successful today as a private equity investor and has achieved uh, phenomenal success in that regard. And, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Drew or, or Steve, or players like uh, you know, Troy Aikman, Eric Karros, uh, a whole range of players who Desmond Howard, uh, who I see on TV often these days, um, you know, who went on to broadcasting careers and and have become leaders in their field. Um, you know, Troy, I think, is is the undisputed uh, you know best color commentator in uh, NFL football days and. You know, and I think, uh, you know, it, it epitomizes the type of athlete that Lee and I uh, strive to represent. Uh, we focused on role modeling. It was something that uh, we talked about with every single client as they sat down and, uh, and talked through, you know, what the art of the possible was in terms of representation. And, uh, and we focused on, you know, giving back, on how important it was to give back to their communities 
that they were part of, whether it be their high schools, their collegiate communities, or uh, or to get involved in the professional community that they were about to become part of. Um, so, you know, by having that as a bit of a, of, of a screening mechanism, we ended up pre-screening the practice pretty effectively and, you know, representing players like Will Clark and Matt Williams and Pat Burrell and uh, Sean Green and Darren Erstead. You know, we had the great fortune of representing some, some real All-American people, not just players. And that made the practice quite unique. Well, I think as I've known you over the years, I'm always amazed at your network and that you've continued to, to maintain the relationships. So as you're sharing now, I know that these athlete relationships that were the foundation to your business career with an agency have stayed in your life and that that network has continued to expand. And we're going to get into that as we talk about your career and its evolution. But I'm aside from the network that you've, I call one of your greatest assets. Um, I think about, you know, describe to our listeners the personal attributes that you would constructively uh, share with us that have enabled you to succeed in this world of agency, this world of business leadership, and now this private equity arena. You know, I'm, I'm often asked this question um, by students in my UCLA Anderson sure. MBA. And, you know, I've had the good fortune uh, since we sold the Padres in 2012. I've uh, been an adjunct professor at UCLA Anderson. And uh, 65 MBA students every year for only one quarter, 10 classes a quarter. But, uh, you know, I, I, I make it back to, uh, to L.A. every Thursday uh, for class in the afternoon for 10 different weeks uh, during the first part of every year. And those students, you know, often ask about, you know, like, how do you negotiate? How do you, what are the skills you need to create a network? You know, kind of a variety of, of, of questions like yours. And what I always tell them, I always begin with this. And, you know, it won't surprise you, Robert, because you, you know this answer. But, you know, the most important skill that I learned, uh, probably from my father, to be fair, uh, was the skill of listening. And, you know, it's like most of us are trained to think that, you know, negotiating, strategic positioning, um, you know, any kind of, you know, conversation in business is about being proactive, being, um, you know, you know, precise and, uh, and uh, you know, communicating a, a, a thesis, you know, appropriately. And by the way, all those things are true along with homework and being prepared and the like. But at the end of the day, the most important skill of all, I believe, is to listen, is to, is to resist the natural human tendency to fill the silence and to sit back and hear what the other people are saying, what the other side is saying, you know, folks on the other side of the table, whatever the setting, um, but, but to listen clearly. And to the extent uh, I've been able to do that. I think it's been a, a helpful part of, you know, kind of evolving my style, my my career, and and ultimately, I suppose, uh, an element of my success. So I really believe keeping your mouth shut is most important of all. Great takeaway for our, our audience, especially some of the younger folks. But I also would just, uh, uh, you're modest, but your, your your intelligence and your discipline and your work ethic, I think, uh, have, have also carried you far. Uh, and I'm sure you take don't do not take those for granted. Uh, maybe the intelligence side. With that, I want to pivot. I want to move from the agency side, which was, I mean, a stellar career, recognized everywhere, great clients, financially doing well. And you said, I want to make a pivot. I want to move from agency to the principal side. Sounds good. Um, I did that in my own career. I moved from a brokerage side, the agency, to a principal side. And, and not, not as easy as one might imagine. So talk about your journey and what caused you to do that and what was the initial reaction from the marketplace? I had a 20-year career um, that, I, you know, was truly a dream career representing athletes. Um, couldn't have asked for more. I mean, we represented 25 quarterbacks at our height. Um, you know, I did 
the vast majority of the negotiation work uh, for our football practice, for our baseball practice, and uh, as well as for our TV and radio practice, where we represented, uh, you know, 25 or so TV broadcasters and sports announcers uh, across the country, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, by the way. Uh, but I, 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 you know, we ended up having three events um, where we sold businesses uh, during those years. And in fact, 1999 was kind of the, uh, the stellar year for the agency in terms of M&A activity. We, we sold an internet business, an early internet business that we had built uh, with athletes. And uh, we had some 200 or so athletes uh, under contract to, uh, to do nothing more than create websites for. We partnered with AOL, um, <laughs> Ted Leonsis and Steve Case back in the day. Um, in fact, uh, Steve Case saw me uh, not too long ago, and he said, "He said, you know, you're you're actually the last group we ever paid for content." He said, "You're you're." He said, "Literally, we never cut another check." But he said, "We did to you." I said, "Oh no, I know. Thank you." <laughs> and, uh, and so we ended up uh, selling that business to Sequoia Capital and. Uh, and IVP, which is now Redpoint. And, um, and that was, you know, kind of project number one. Project number two was a sports marketing business that we had built uh, with some very capable operators, uh, Frank Vuno, Steve Rosner, Fred Freed, uh, back in New York, uh, outside the, just outside the city in New Jersey. Uh, and Integrated Sports International was a business that we ended up selling to uh, Bob Sillerman, when he was rolling up sports assets and ultimately uh, rolled up David Falk's agency, uh, the agent uh, made famous by his representation of Michael Jordan, as well as Patrick Ewing. And uh, and so, you know, we felt like, you know, that was a, a, a great uh, return for us. And then most importantly, we sold our, our core agency. And we sold it to a financial service firm, ironically, a firm called Asante, uh, at the time headed up by a guy named Marty Weinberg, uh, who we became quite fond of. And we were able to uh, sell the agency uh, for a significant amount of money. And I went on an employment contract. And at the time, you know, friends of mine, some in our forum, Robert, uh, used to ask, like, why are you still working so hard? And I said... I used to always say, look, I never did this you know, for the money. I did it because I love the work. And the fact is, you know, with some you know, capital gains dollars in my pocket, I began to dream of my second career. And for me, that was moving over to ownership, which nobody from the agent side had ever done before. And uh, I don't believe they've done it since. Uh, there have been a number who have moved over to management roles. Uh, but nobody had tackled kind of management and ownership. And so I uh, took all the bullets um, and arrows, and there were a lot from, from all sides. Uh, you know, the labor side of the business, the unions, uh, you know, kind of scratched their head and said, wait a minute, you know, is this, is this okay? We have one of ours, you know, going over to ownership and, you know, the baseball union uh, as they oversaw my transition, or I'm sorry, uh, M- MLB, as they oversaw my transition to uh, to becoming a general partner as well as the CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks, um, you know, spent a lot of time scrutinizing the transaction and interviewing me, making sure that I had really cut ties with the agency, which I had. Uh, of course, once once you explain that you'd actually sold the underlying business then people understood that there really weren't continuing fee streams that were coming from that business. And that's what they were concerned about, to be fair. So, um, look, it, it, took, uh, it took a year, the better part of a year. I had a very capable partner in Ken Kendrick, um, who fought alongside me and, you know, frankly, gave me the opportunity there. Um, and although I developed a lot of friends in Arizona over the years, to be fair, um, you know, Ken was the one who stood by me early, and I'll never forget that. That's great. So we moved from Arizona, same practice of sorts, over to the Padres as kind of your next principal transaction. 
which was a more significant underwriting and I'll say accomplishment for you. So color that a bit for us, if you can, the transition there. It was, um, you know, I put together a, a small group, about uh, a dozen uh, LPs who came in with me, um, a number of prominent uh, San Diego families, uh, as well as, um, you know, friends uh, from other industries and people that I'd met, uh, quite frankly. And, you know, we raised uh, uh, enough capital to buy half the Padres in 2009. And by the way, raising money at the end of 2008 was not much fun. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, my share of sleepless nights and um, the way things worked out in Arizona, um, you know, I was not uh, able to protect my job uh, in the event that San Diego didn't work. So um, it was it was do or die. And uh, and I felt it uh, and I, you know, carried a, a huge burden of getting that deal done, but we did. And we did because um, I had a partner in John Moores uh, who owned the team uh, with his wife and the two of them had divorced or were going through a divorce. And as a result, um, the opportunity became what it was. And uh, as a surprise to me, quite frankly, I had not counted on running the club day to day but rather was just going to oversee the investment side of it. And John asked if I would consider taking on the role of vice chairman and CEO of, of the Padres. So I jumped uh, at the opportunity. It was a um, really, a, you know, a, a terrific one. And, you know, I guess the way I look back at it, Robert, is, um, you know, if, if it took me a, a year to get my feet on the ground in Arizona, uh, learning or going through kind of my business school education uh, on the job. Um, it, in San Diego, we, we did it all much more quickly and efficiently. And, you know, we changed out uh, something like 18 out of 30 members of the leadership team in the first three months that uh, we were there and, you know, built uh, a, a team and a foundation for going forward, which, I think even today is still influencing some of this success that the Padres have had. Uh, for example, Eric Brutner, the CEO of the team, was my general counsel, who Tom Garfinkel and I hired uh, when we were running the team day to day. And Eric uh, just stopped over in my UCLA class a couple of weeks ago and spoke to my students. So it's great to see uh, some of that continuing. But uh, but you're right, San Diego was a a terrific uh, platform for me. And, and it was one that I, I felt like I stepped into and ran much more efficiently uh, than, than, than the time it took to do the same in Arizona. What, what I observed as we would talk about your San Diego experience, while you had been a fiduciary and you had the agency representation and the, that legal seat, I think your, your Padres experience really taught you how to be an investment manager on behalf of other people's money, um, which we're going to get into now with your next chapter um, and your evolution into the, the private equity space, if you will, uh, within within sports with um, with MSP. So uh, talk about that putting that set of shoes on, Jeff, just to be to manage other people's money and to think about that as you said. I'm now going to go out and extend the principal side one leg with now being able to do different types of investments. So maybe a little bit, what is MSP? What does it do today? And talk about the role as a fiduciary with other people's money in that regard. Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, you're right, San Diego was uh, the, my, my first real opportunity doing that and playing that important role. And, and quite frankly, I made mistakes along the way. And I, I learned from them, um, but you know it it, it it takes a different mindset to uh, to truly put others first at all at all times. And I, um, you know, there are times when you know I would look at an opportunity and you know kind of instinctively jump on it the way I always had um, yeah. with some self interest and obviously you know capital from third parties, and then I realize that the 
the self-interest doesn't fit, uh, or it needs to come secondary as part of part of the larger group. And so, you know, as I mastered that tone, and it really is a tone that I think needs to be, you know, properly positioned. Um, and it took me a while, but rolling that into you know my current investment platform, which is technically called MSP Sports Capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I would say that today we, uh, and I'll tell you who we is in a second, but we, we, we truly have more fun looking at opportunities in the sports industry. And we look at everything and anything. If it's in sports, touches sports, we're interested. And, you know, we don't do very many deals. I think last year we did um, one transaction after looking at something like 250 different opportunities you know, teams, leagues, businesses in the in the sports ecosystem, you know, everything uh, in that regard is what we look at and analyze. And, you know, like every investment business, we probably take those 250 or so opportunities that come toward us uh, or at us every year and, you know, seriously look at probably 50 and uh, then you know, more seriously in a due diligence form, look at probably 10. And, uh, and as I said, you know, often do one a year and sometimes maybe a couple a year, but that's it. And we don't, uh, we really don't have an appetite for anything more than, you know, what feels right. And by the way, if there's, you know, two or three during the same year, believe me, we'll jump on them and we'll get very serious about them and try to get them done. But, we need to feel good about the investment thesis and we need to feel good about, you know, the opportunity that we're delivering to RLP. And, uh, you know, we uh, take that obligation very seriously. So we quickly yes. uh, it is a, a handful of folks uh, in New York. Uh, we have an office in New York and the, uh, the my co-principal in the firm is a, uh, a legendary uh, family office investor named John Najafi. Uh, John uh, is based in Phoenix. He and I had gotten to know each other when I ran the Diamondbacks, and he was uh, uh, an independent investor uh, buying and selling companies, uh, including a significant investment in the Phoenix Suns. So even today, he's the second largest investor in the Suns, and has sat on the NBA Board of Governors for the last 17 years. So John and I came together around a Formula One opportunity uh, called Force India. It turned out we were both looking at the same team, and uh, the CEO of the business over in London uh, one day said to me, he said, you know there's another American investor looking at this. I said, "Uh, no, I didn't actually. He said, yeah, it's a guy named John Najafi. So I looked him dead in the eye and said, never heard of him. <laughs> and uh, although I went straight to my hotel room and luckily I had John's cell number, I called him. I'm like, dude, are you looking at Force India? He said, yeah, we should join forces. <laughs> I said, done. And that's about how long it took us to uh, form the initial uh, relationship that ended up morphing into MSP Sports Capital. And uh, today, uh, John is my partner and frankly, uh, the best partner I've ever had. Well, I've met him. He's a class act and you guys are a good team. Um, I think I would share this next uh, section of our conversation in that you and I are sharing common that we both make investments. Uh, we underwrite them. We think about structures. We compete. We raise debt and equity. Um, as I think about your collateral, though, it's atypical collateral. It's really illiquid collateral. But there is a market for it with investors. And as evidenced with your outcome with the Padres and some things you've done, you've done very well by it. But it's not for the faint of heart, given that, that it's less predictable, the, the, the path to an exit, if you will, or the ongoing performance. But talk a little bit about, I think about things like the X Games. I mean, the one that we've got to talk about is obviously, you know, Formula One racing and what you've done there with McLaren. I think if you don't mind using that as a case study to respond to the collateral, how you structure your investments and how that looks, um, that would be really insightful for everyone to hear. Yeah. Um, 
Look, the McLaren transaction, uh, uh, which was the third Formula One opportunity that John and I looked at, um, ended up becoming a reality at the end of 2020 um, during COVID. And it, it turned out it was our COVID project. And the opportunity came from a relation, a set of relationships that we had uh, developed with uh, the sovereign wealth fund of Bahrain uh, called Mumtalakat. And uh, at the time, I got to know, uh, as did John, the CEO and the CIO of Mumtalakat, and just made it clear that we were interested in the event there was ever an opportunity to invest in their Formula One team. Uh, McLaren is a you know, 60 year old race team. Um, the Crown Prince of Bahrain decided to start a, an automotive arm of that company uh, probably a dozen years ago. And uh, when COVID uh, hit them in the face, like all other auto manufacturers back in you know, early 2020, um, they determined that it was important to raise strategic capital to come in and support the racing side. So they called us, the CEO of the business, Zach Brown, who may be one of the finest CEOs I've ever seen, <laughs> uh, incredibly effective at doing his job, incredibly effective at leading uh, the McLaren racing uh, operation. He and the chairman of McLaren, uh, uh, another uh, world famous, uh, world class business man named Paul Walsh, uh, who had run Diageo for many years and um, had a legendary career, sits on the board today of FedEx and McDonald's, for example. And Paul and Zach called us uh, and asked John and me if we would have an interest in making a strategic investment into racing. And we said, absolutely. Tell us what the facts are. They did. And we said, okay, give us 24 hours and we'll come back to you with a structure. Um, we, we literally got back to them in a day and we said, look, if you're willing to carve out the racing business and make it a standalone business um, such that uh, automotive you know, obviously we would be supporters of, but we wouldn't be tied to the automotive side of the business going forward directly. So they said, we're open to that. Uh, in the end, we established our own board of directors, our own governance, um, and our own capital stack. And um, we brought a commitment of 210 million pounds to the table. Um, we structured it as debt. Uh, it has, and it's public record, um, uh, that we did it that way, but uh, so that we we have a coupon, um, most of which was picked, um, but some of what some of which was cash pay, and we also had about thirty three percent of the equity in warrants hmm. as part of the deal. So it turned out that the company uh, began to uh, succeed. Uh, shortly thereafter, I'd say in the next year, it became obvious that they weren't going to draw down the full 210 million. Turned out they drew 150. So our warrants ended up equating to more like 28 or 30 percent as opposed to the 33. Um, but John and I sit on the board. Uh, we brought two institutional investors in as LPs, uh, UBS O'Connor as well as Aries uh, Capital, which uh, both of whom we've had terrific relationships with. And we also brought in four family offices. Um, along with our own capital, uh, we were the largest LP uh, on the family office side. And, uh, you know, we have a, a small manageable partnership that also um, controls the exit. So, you know, you talk about exit. In this case, um, we um, are about to have some of our debt paid down, uh, probably in the next uh, you know 30 days or so, and uh, we'll stay in the investment. Uh, frankly, as long as it's on the upswing, which the industry has been generally, uh, it's forced uh, up or at least created a valuation that's demonstrably better 
uh, than where we invested in. We invested at a 375 million pound uh, pre-money valuation. And you know, Forbes just valued the team uh, last year at 2.3 billion uh, US. Um, so you know, regardless of currency, uh, you know, we know that it's been a, a significant success. And, and we're, we're thrilled because you know, we win, McLaren wins, and we know that uh, we all have a much more valuable business today than when we started. Obviously, the, the, the wind has hit your sails with the drive to survive and the different, the, the media implosion and just the popularity of F1 racing. So was that underwritten at any level? Because I recall conversations with you about we're going to bring marketing to bear. We're going to bring some some sophisticated approaches to F1 that maybe they haven't thought about before to enhance value above and beyond just making a good baseline investment. So talk a little bit about just some of the things that happened along the way that enhanced and maybe you saw in your vision. Look, I think sometimes it uh, it pays to be lucky. And, uh, and in this circumstance, uh, you know, we identified the opportunity for sure. Uh, we structured it, but to be fair, uh, we were also quite fortunate. Uh, I don't think anybody could have predicted the success that uh, Formula One has had in those uh, ensuing three years, uh, almost three and a half now. Um, the fact is Drive to Survive was um, certainly uh, significant. They already had a couple seasons on the board by the time we uh, invested. Um, and I often encouraged a prospective investor to, to watch a couple episodes to understand much better what the behind the scenes nature of Formula One was. Um, but I will tell you, like all of us, uh, we passed the hat in a lot of places. And there are a whole lot of people that said no, uh, that are now saying, well, if there's ever an opportunity to get involved, you know, in the next go round, uh, to the extent you have LPs that are exiting or, or whatever, we'd be interested. So, you know, we have a long list of people who, you know, now, uh, of course, would be interested in coming uh, into our investment. And, and by the way, we may actually do a recap of sorts, uh, just privately, uh, because we have some LPs that uh, would just as soon, um, you know, take some money off the table and probably stay in for a part as well. So, um, you know, that's always a, an ongoing discussion, to be fair. But, um, you know, I don't know that. I mean, look, we don't uh, we don't run the business. Uh, we certainly have significant influence. Um, we have negative controls as part of our security. Okay. Uh, but the fact is, Zach Brown and Paul Walsh and Zach's management team run the business, and they do an unbelievably success or significant, uh, significantly successful uh, uh, approach in doing that. So, you know, I, I don't want to take anything away from them. We're supporters. Uh, we're active board members, and uh, we've also gotten to know others in the industry from, you know, the Liberty folks, uh, Greg Maffei on down to, uh, you know, who own the sport, who own Formula One, uh, to the CEO, Stefano Domantelli, who's a fabulous leader in and of himself. So it's been a great ride all, all, all the way around, Robert. Sure. Well, you're still a young guy. Uh, we're, we're, well, we're, we're now in YPO Gold together, which is the, uh, the next version of, of YPO and, and, and loving it and interacting and sharing. And I heard you say the other day that you you're now really living the best version of yourself. And I see that as your friend. I see that in just your your passion and your approach. But describe what that means to our audience a bit. And, and what's next for Jeff Morad as we look down the, the career channel? Yeah, look, I, I, uh, I, I'm happy. I have three grown sons, uh, you know. Two of them unemployed at the moment, but both on the way to employment. And uh, the third one's uh, been employed for some time. And, you know, they're all in their 20s, uh, two in their late 20s. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be part of their lives. But um, I also think you're right. Um, you know, I feel like I'm living my best life now. And, um, you know, it's a function of all my experiences. You talked earlier about network. Um, you know, that network continues to, uh, to surprise me. 
Um, you know, as I move around the world, uh, you know, I was in uh, Las Vegas recently for the Super Bowl. And, you know, it's just, it's mind boggling to me how many of these relationships cross over and how over time, you know, people and remember people from roles they've had in the past. Um, but they're still in the industry. The sports industry is a fairly closed industry that, you know, you really need to be referred in or know somebody in it to get an opportunity. Uh, you know, these business schools and even law schools are pumping out graduates who take sports management classes or sports law classes. I, I hate to say it, but there aren't that many roles in the world for the, the grads that focus on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's a special industry in a lot of ways, but, uh, but again, the, uh, the network always comes back around. Perfect example. We're hosting the X games in Aspen, uh, last month. And, um, it turns out, uh, you know, there's a, there's a you know, tall athletic looking guy, you know, wearing sunglasses at night, leaning against the post. And, you know, this, you know, one of my guys says, you know, Hey, you know, that's Joe Burrow. I'm like, you mean the quarterback of the Bengals? He's like, yeah. I go, what's he doing here? He said, I don't know. Well, <laughs> as you would know, Robert, because it's what I do, I walked right up to him and said, Joe, Jeff Morad, how are you? And uh, kind of looked at me and I said, I said, by the way, my partner, John Najafi, and I you know, own this property. And um, he said, oh, really? He said, well, look, I'm here because you know I've watched X Games my entire life, but Never had an opportunity to come see it in person. So he brought a couple of buddies with him and, you know, we chatted about, uh, you know, everything from his new contract to, uh, you know, the uh, Super Bowl uh, performance against the Rams, uh, which didn't go quite the way he wanted it at the end. Right. But, um, you yeah, know, we had a great visit. And during that conversation, I was able to tell him that one of my great friends in, uh, in the NFL uh, was somebody who, uh, you know, not a lot of people got close to, but it was Mike Brown, his owner. And, you know, I told him the story of how when I left uh, the agent business and moved over to uh, management and ownership in baseball, uh, there was one NFL owner who wrote me a letter and congratulated me, and it was Mike Brown. Wow. And those are the things that, you know, you remember forever. Uh, we ended up representing probably seven first-round draft picks in Cincinnati uh, over the years. Unfortunately, a number of them never advanced dramatically in their careers. But you know, doing that and you know, spending the time with uh, with someone, even though he's an unbelievably capable adversary, who today you know, relies on his daughter, who's uh, equally capable, by the way. Uh, but, you know, just having that relationship and being able to reference it to his current quarterback was uh, who he'd given $275 million to last year was kind, of a, was kind of a fun thing to do. Well, again, that's a great example of living your best version of your life right now in all the, all the way that it's, you're, you're remaining connected. I want to be mindful of your time. And as we look to kind of wind this down, um, I think it would be appropriate to talk to our youth on the that are listening. Um, you love to give back. You give back in different ways, whether it's philanthropic causes like uh, Augie's Quest with our dear friend, um, his fight with ALS, to what you're doing at UCLA, which you referenced earlier. But what message might you leave younger people about starting out in a career? Um, just some things that they should consider as they look to that landscape, which can be challenging, complicated for a young person. And you, you mentioned your, your, your sons in that regard. So leave us with some career advice or some life advice for a young person getting started out, if you don't mind. You know, I just had this discussion with a good friend in Newport Beach. Um, and, you know, he's similarly aged, uh, uh, retired. Uh, in his case, uh, was a you know an executive with a you know a, a large U.S. company for many years, and and it, we we kind of chuckled to ourselves because we were talking about you know kind of young people who were starting out, and he he said something that I'll never forget. He said he said you know they don't really understand that they can do anything, right? And I, you know what? You're right. I said that's exactly right. 
And, and, and so I guess that would, you know, essentially kind of motivate the advice that, uh, or begin to form the advice that I'd offer. It's, it's, you know, there are no rules at some level other than integrity and, you know, doing the right thing and conducting yourself the right way. There are no rules in terms of what you can succeed at. And I would encourage uh, young people to think about, you know, breaking through in whatever, whatever is in their heart. So, you know, it may seem, you know, I just had a discussion recently with a young aspiring baseball agent who <laughs> kind of fricked up the choice he had of going to work for an established agency or setting out on his own like I did and trying to create a platform for himself before he maybe joined a larger group. And by the time we hung up, I had convinced them that, you know, at the end of the day, the latter was going to make him happiest. In other words, go be an entrepreneur. Go go chase your dream in whatever way that is. Um, again, within reason, we all have realities, whether it's, uh, you know, a family or responsibilities to other people. Um, so being mindful of those, I, I still would always encourage and lean toward somebody, you know, taking the less traveled route as opposed to the more traditional one. Jeff, you did not disappoint, my friend. Uh, this was a 10, and I can't thank you enough. Many takeaways that I noted. Uh, the first was clearly your career superpower is being a good listener. I also had noted your advice for young people to follow your dreams and go for it. And lastly, despite the famous movie that was ironically filmed in your office with the line, show me the money, in Jerry Maguire, your advice is to not go for the money, but pursue your passion and money will follow. We look forward to having you back on our Counting Capital podcast, as there's so much more to discuss with you. Thanks very much, pal. Thank you, Robert. Proud to be a client too. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Counting Capital Podcast. For informational purposes only and not to be relied on in any manner as legal, business, financial, tax, or investment advice, nothing in this episode is an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy securities. To learn more about Buchanan Street Partners, please visit our website at BuchananStreet.com. Buchanan Street Partners. Capital you can count on.